Today I'm pulling out a yearbook, and I will tell you the year, but I'm not going to tell you the year because then that will, you'll, you'll be reminded how old I am, but this is one of the yearbooks from high school, and when you look at a yearbook or a photo album, whatever the case may be, typically, obviously, is filled with uh, pictures um, uh, from multiple events and scenarios, but it's pretty obvious that not every single picture made it to the yearbook. If you look at your photo albums at home, there are some pictures that did not make the photo album for whatever reason. This morning, I want you to think about our Vacation Bible School exactly in the same manner. The, the theme of the wildlife life has to do with the encounters, encounters with Jesus. And when we talk about encounters with Jesus, we're speaking primarily of events in the lives of people that happen. Now, for us, it's unavoidable. Social media has revolutionized the way we do pictures and videos and images. And the one thing that social media forces us to do, which typically yearbooks or photo albums don't do that for us, social media gives us a chronology. And if you're on social media, now every social media venue from Instagram to Facebook to everything else, they kind of a freely on their own, they send you or they place you in front of you um, memories, like a picture from four years ago, seven years ago, whatever the case may be. The Bible wasn't written chronologically. And I'm bringing this up to you because when we look at what the kids are going to be looking at throughout this week, it's not the history of the life of Jesus, it's the stories of the life of Jesus. So if, again, if you can come back and think in terms more of a yearbook, because again, in the yearbook, there is no chronology. It's more of a just random pictures that you know, show up, with, which in this case, obviously, whoever worked in the yearbook back in those days is the people that chose or decided what pictures to put on. Well, for us, the yearbook of Jesus, which is the scriptures or the gospels, it is the inspired authors that they, by the direction of the Holy Spirit, chose specific narratives events, uh, teaching experiences. So for instance, when it comes to day one this week, they're going to be speaking of the encounter with Jesus. One single encounter, one single event uh, recorded in the book of Matthew chapter 22 of Jesus on water. Some of you may know what the story is going to be uh, about. On day number two, it's going to be recorded from chapter 20 of the book of John and it's going to be the experience, the narrative of the encounter with the resurrected Christ. So is the encounter at the tomb. So again, it's not the, it's not the history or the stories of Jesus. The last one that we're going to be looking at this week is basically the encounter on the road. And the road to, that's right, is uh, Luke chapter 24, verses 13 through 35. So as we launch on this beautiful Sunday and we go into this week, we're going to be closing up next Sunday with this emphasis on Vacation Bible School. I want to remind you that, again, these are very specific snapshots, if I want to use that term, of what these stories are. Not the history, but the stories of Jesus. And on a Sunday like this, I want us to think about the, the, the centrality of this message because this week, what, what Vacation Bible School is going to focus is going to be on the closing of the resurrection of Jesus. Again, there's going to be multiple events, multiple pictures, but the specific picture that they're going to focus is going to be on the resurrection of Jesus. The entire chapter 20, which is the end of this fourth gospel. So you have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And this John gospel is written by a guy that historically we understand that he died out of old age. So he's looking at his audience, which is basically Christians and non-Christians, but specifically Christians, churches, and they're going through a very difficult time because John, as an old guy, John, who is said historically that he's related to Jesus, like family members, so, so maybe if Jesus ever had a yearbook or maybe a family album, there's a chance that he was there in early years of childhood, John. We, we don't know for sure. But John is doing some sort of a resume, some putting, putting pictures together specifically for the audience because suffering and confusion is just growing into this scenario. And John, as he closes the, the book, the gospel, he's coming into this affirmation and says, Jesus, he goes straight into the character of Jesus. Jesus, what did Jesus do? 
He performed. Remember John 3.16? For God so loved the world. What did he do? He performed. God from the beginning. He's a doer. He's, a, he's somebody that takes you know, love not as a noun, but as a, as a verb, as action. So, so Jesus performed. What did he perform? He performed signs, wonders, miracles. Now, once again, this is chapter 20. Our kids are going to be looking at this chapter on day number two because the entire chapter 20, if you read the previous 29 verses, it's about the resurrection of Jesus. And apparently, here's what I want you to hear. Apparently, the guys that walk with Jesus through his entire ministry, through his entire three years of ministry, three and a half years of ministry, they needed a little bit of a confirmation that he was a resurrected Christ. In other words, we are in the time in human history, right here, right now, within the inner circle, that specific group of people, that very special group of people, who apparently, this is my conclusion by looking at the yearbook, okay, the gospel, um, I'm concluding that these guys who walk with Jesus... Apparently, they believed in Jesus, but once Jesus died and was placed on a graveside, they did not believe Jesus. Have you ever been in that place where you believe in Jesus, but you don't believe Jesus? How about God? Do you believe in God? Most people do. Now, the question is, do you believe him? Did you believe on the things that he said he was going to do? Because what we understand is that the disciples, nobody, there was no one in the whole context of, you know, disciples and Christians and people in this time in history, that when Jesus was placed on that graveside, no one was outside the graveside waiting for Jesus to come out of the grave. Why? Because they believe in Jesus. They just didn't believe, they didn't believe Jesus. So because of that, look at what happens. So now, Again, historically, if you read the previous verses, we are, apparently, we're about the three, third week after Jesus' resurrection. So Jesus resurrected. First week goes by. He's showing signs and wonders. Second week goes by. He's showing signs and wonders. Third week shows, comes by, and he finds, in this context, one of the disciples by the name of Thomas, that in the previous weeks, when Jesus showed up to them as a resurrected Christ, resurrected Savior, Thomas said, I don't believe you until I can see his wounds and I can touch the side on his body. Well, apparently we're in that part where Jesus shows up to Thomas and says, Thomas, come here, buddy. It is I. And shows him, gives him the sign that he is who he said he was. This week... Most of the families, most of us, once again, we come into places like this because we believe in God. But when times get a little harder, tougher, difficult, we struggle to believe, to believe God. So what do we do? Well, here's what happens. We, we see that, again, the signs were given in the presence of the disciples, which are, again, recorded. Think of the snapshots. Think of a your book in this book. This morning, what I want you to see is this, that the signs and the wonders, and by the way, just parenthesis, quick commercial, signs and wonders, miracles today, they do exist. But just like in history, just like in present reality, and even future experiences, signs and wonders are always means to an end. Nothing wrong with, with God performing a miracle, but let's be careful that we do not worship the miracle. Does that make sense? Let's be careful that we do not evaluate God's goodness because of his active involvement miraculously or maybe the absence of a miracle. I'm bringing this up to you because the point of the miracles was to prove that Jesus was, was alive. Now, my question to you is, do you believe, do you think that if Jesus was alive, especially for the audience, the audience is the guys who saw Jesus being tortured, abused, brutally just put into this cross, Roman cross, eventually died and then put into a graveside. So this is a crucial thing for them. And they, they see Jesus showing those signs to them to prove that he is alive. How does he do that? Well, again, John just told us that he's doing it by performing signs and wonders. Some of the signs that he did, once again, one of them is showing Thomas his, his wounds. Jesus is saying, hey, let me show you who I am. And the other one, which is my favorite, Jesus has spent a lot of time in about 40 days between the resurrection and the ascension. So Jesus resurrected on a Sunday morning, and approximately 40 days later, Jesus is going back to the Father physically. Physically goes back to the Father. But in between, what did he do? 
He got a lot of meals going on between them. So apparently, some of the evidences that Jesus is alive is his suffering, but it's also his celebration. So for me, when I look at this passage, what I'm going to try, we're going to try to emphasize this week is that the resurrection of Jesus is not simply the way that if you put your trust in Jesus, when you die like Jesus, you go straight to heaven. Although it's true, and we believe that you go to heaven after you die. Look at me for a second. That's important, but I believe it's even more, more crucial, more important to understand that 33 years of Jesus on this earth is to remind us that heaven is not the absence of hell. Heaven is not simply the place that you go after you die. Heaven begins right here, right now. How do I know this? Because when Jesus lived 33 years on this earth, and he died and then returned from among the dead is to simply to show us that the win is to walk in Christ's likeness while we are on earth. I'm bringing this up to you because, again, our tendency, our tendency is to think like this. This is, this is what we typically think. We say, okay, so I'm just going to tolerate. I'm going to endure. I'm going to try my best. Eventually, everybody dies, and we go to... Real place, real life, you know, no pain, no crying, no sorrow, the fullness of glory, which is true, which is true. But let me say this one more time. If Jesus, all that he wanted was for us to go to heaven, try our best, go to heaven, he wouldn't have to live 33 years on earth. He would just have gone straight to a cross, die, and come back from the death. What's the point? That if you disregard 33 years of lifestyle, worldview, feelings, thinking, reactions, processing. If you disregard those things, all that you are embracing and believing is the forgiveness of your sins. And if you've been with us long enough, you will remember this, that being forgiven of your sins is not enough. You have to embrace also the righteousness of Jesus, the worldview of Jesus. So when the time comes that you encounter Jesus, it's not enough to believe in Jesus. You're going to need to believe Jesus. You have to believe him. Well, what does that mean? Because these guys eventually are going to believe Jesus. John, which is one of the guys that believed Jesus, eventually, he didn't believe at the beginning, but later, the Bible says this, but this, what's the this? The signs, the wonders, the, the miracles, the appearances, they were written, they were put into this, you know, uh, historical uh, uh, writings for the purpose that all of you, not just you, but all of us, all of us may believe. Here's the thing that I hope, and you can take this week with you this morning with you, and I think this is the story of most, of us, most of us. If you're sitting in this place and you don't believe, if you're sitting in this place and you used to believe, if you're sitting in this place and you don't know if you actually believe, more than likely, if I, if I can hear your story, it's probably because you have done life by yourself, because you have trusted your own understanding, your sufficiency, your accomplishments, your, or maybe you're at the place where things happen in your life that were catastrophic, irreversible, things that you never thought you would ever experience, and you make yourself the victim. All that I'm trying to tell you is this. The Bible presents believed as a result of community, not as, not as a result of simply just getting things right in my life. Why is that important? Because look at the definition of believed. This is, these are the disciples struggling to move him from believing in Jesus to believing Jesus. Which, by the way, quick commercial also. Not only Jesus is in this transition of 40 days between resurrection and ascension, but eventually this is John, which is the fourth gospel in the New Testament. The fifth book of the New Testament is the book of Acts. And every one of these Gospels from Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they end with the resurrection of Jesus. The fifth book of the New Testament, which is Acts, begins with the ascension of Jesus. What's the point? That eventually Jesus is going to depart from them physically. He's not going to be with them anymore. And what I'm trying to tell you is that the moment Jesus goes up to the Father, it's pretty obvious that they're going to struggle to believe not only in Jesus, but they're going to struggle to believe Jesus, and especially because John is writing to them in a time of persecution. 
So in a time of persecution and conflict, here's what I want you to understand. That if you're in this place and you are to believe Jesus, this is what it means to believe Jesus. Not just in Jesus, but believe Jesus. You must welcome, welcome, welcome Jesus. You're going to welcome Jesus. You, you, you have to be a recipient. You have to be someone that actually says yes to the person of Jesus. Now here's the warning. If you were to do that or if you have done that, the implication is the result of welcoming Jesus, the result of welcoming Jesus is not the absence of problems, the absence of confusion, the absence of disbelief. I think we everybody goes through crisis of faith or whatever. But look at what happens is that in the middle of your pain, in the middle of your tragedy, in the middle of your confusion, in the middle of deception and betrayal, Jesus, the person that you welcome, is able to take the good, the bad, and the ugly of your life and my life and enlarge, not your person, but enlarge his very own character. This is why when you read the scriptures and you go into the epistles, so you get the gospels, you get Acts, but specifically the rest of the New Testament is the dysfunctionality of churches, the, the, the fighting between apostles, the people who struggle between believing in Jesus and believing Jesus, and in the context of brokenness and deception and betrayal and sinfulness and all that, the character of Jesus is enlarged. So please hear me say this. I am not implying that you should sin, that you should betray, that you should rebel so you can exalt Jesus. All that I'm saying is that once Jesus comes into your life, He's not coming to simply improve you and get a better version of yourself. He's coming to take over. He is Lord. He reigns. He is supreme. He is Jesus. Does that make sense? Well, that Lordship that enlarges His character, it reflects this way. This is how it reflects. It reflects by men and women who have welcomed Jesus, who are literally enlarging his character by making decisions through the character of, of Jesus. Making decisions through the world view of Jesus. Obviously, for me, when it comes to the person of Jesus, the character of Jesus is reflected in the scriptures. So, obviously, you got to read the Bible, and that's why He's given us the warning that they were written so we can believe. They were written so we can believe in a communal. Now, the, the believing, let me finish with this. The believing, the, 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 the concept of believing in God and believing God is so we can see that Jesus, not the church, Jesus, not your family, Jesus, not you. Jesus, not this country. Jesus is the Messiah. That Jesus' arrival came with a specific task, a specific mission. The word Messiah simply means anointed, chosen one. Messiah implies that he came with a specific vocation, a specific task, a specific plan created and, and, and structured before the creation of the world. So for us, the word Messiah, this setting apart in Jesus was the concept that he was set apart for God. He comes for 33 years and lives among us. But eventually, the passion of Jesus, the ending of the life of Jesus, is that Jesus is going to be required to be set apart, not just for God, but also from God. The vocation of Jesus, the reason why he comes, please hear me say this closely, is to suffer. And to suffer, not because God is pleased in suffering, it's because suffering is the, is the wages, is the consequences of sin. The problem for humanity is the concept of disbelief, the concept of, you know, apathy, the concept of detachment, but it's simply rebellion. So how do you fix, how do you move, how do you move from, how, how do you go into the experience of believing in Jesus and believing Jesus? You need somebody that is going to pay the price of detachment from God. So at the cross, Jesus cries out to the Father and says, Father, why have you, come on, why have you forsaken me? Why? The reason why Jesus got forsaken from the Father is so you and I can have access, your kids and my kids throughout this week will have access to be set apart for God. Now, again, it's pretty obvious. Hear me say this closely. I'm implying that the more that you believe, the more that you enlarge the character, the more that you welcome this person, the more that you make decisions through the worldview of Jesus Christ, the more that you're going to recognize your problem. 
and your problem and my problem is not that I have a temper. It's not that I'm coming from a dysfunctional family. It's not the person that I marry or I used to be married. It's not my fears or the, the, the uncertainty of life. Look at me for a second. Your problem and my problem, the more that we approach Jesus, is to see how apart we are from God. But through God's mercy, through Messiah, the Bible says that this Jesus who is Messiah, who is set apart not only from God, but eventually for God, is also the Son, the Son of God. This is extremely important to the audience of John, because the audience of John and John himself, they always understood this word Messiah as an office, as a responsibility, as a title. And it is. So in the Old Testament, which is the Bible of these guys, Messiah was a title given to priests, given to kings, given to anybody that operated in that sense of mediators between priests and kings and prophets for the first time in human history for the first time in human history god has not given us the title into a some into a person god has given us a family member why because god knows that what he wants from us is what he had with his son jesus intimacy identity based on that relationship and ultimately is righteousness which is not the absence of sin simply the pursuit of the character of jesus as we pray this morning would you consider would you open your life and your heart to remind yourself this morning that the concept of this son of god the relationship between the son and the father jesus and god the father is what creates between them intimacy identity and eventually righteousness if you are in this place and you have never given your life to jesus the way you give your life to jesus is not by seeking god it's by seeking the relationship of the son and the father in other words all that i'm trying to tell you is if you were to join the community of believer the believers by believing who he said he is implying the relationship of god and the son that's how you get saved most of us we want to go from a single you it's me it's my prayer it's when i believe it's straight to the father it does not work like that there, there, is no, there is no special kind of a loophole. You, you have to go through the context of community because the time is going to come where you believe is going to be questioned and challenged. The time is going to come where instead of believing Jesus, you're going to conform and simply settle to believe in Jesus. This is a time where you need to understand that the more that you believe who he is, you're reminded that he's enlarging his character in you. And eventually where you find the hope of your life it's in the faithfulness that the Father gave to the Son. That although the Son was placed on a cross and He eventually died, the Father said and did what He promised He was going to do with the Son on the third day. On the third day, which is the whole context of John 20. The Father takes the corpse, the lifeless body of Jesus. And that Sunday morning, the Spirit of God comes and dwells on that body and brings Jesus back from the death. And if you were to trust that entire process, John says that is only and then by believing you may have life in His name. Would you pray with me?